Thank you, Tony. Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. It's truly good to gather together in our Father's house. We have uh, with us this morning, uh, one of our prodigals has returned. Wayne, it's, it's Holland Baugh, right? Wayne, many of you remember Wayne from a, a few years back. Um, but we're glad that you're here with us, and we hope that, we pray that this will be a time of blessing for you. So, good to have you. All right, let's get started, if you would, please, with our life verse for August. This comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. Uh, they are the words of our Lord as they're found in chapter 6 and verse 6. Let's go ahead and read this passage together. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Today is the final day to receive school supplies uh, for the children that are served by the South Richmond Baptist Center. I want to thank you all for your generosity. Paula, you guys have a lot of work ahead of you today. There's a table full of supplies back there. Uh, and I know that the children will be blessed because of your generosity. Also, starting today, you will find, once again, our giving tree has new leaves, which contain items that are per non-perishable food items. Uh, that we're once again collecting for area food banks, including uh, the place of, min place of miracles that we have been helping uh, over these past several weeks now. We can always use some extra hands on Friday afternoons at Place of Miracles. It's located off of, uh, what's it now called, Richmond Highway. It's Jeff Davis, you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, down near where Mr. Peanut, for those of you that remember Mr. Peanut, uh, it's right close to Mr. Peanut. <laughs> yes, yes, Ken, Kenny's doing his Mr. Peanut impression for me and got me off guard there for a minute. Uh, but yeah, down on Route 1, uh, we meet there on Friday afternoons around 2. It's about an hour and a half, two hours worth of work. It's work, but it's well worth it, and it goes to help a lot of families in, who are in need. Check with Jimmy, uh, and he can give you more information if you'd like to help out with that. Uh, also, a reminder today, our WMU will meet in this first Sunday school room immediately following worship. And, uh, of course, all ladies in the church are welcome to come and be a part of that. And speaking of the ladies, Tuesday morning at 1130, we will have women's Bible study uh, here in the sanctuary. Katie. Did I say 1130? 12.30. Normally it's 12. Well, I was kind of just covering all bases. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Show up around lunchtime on Tuesday and Katie will... No, Bible study, 1230. Right. On Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. That's not a permanent change, is it? No. Okay. Because I'm going to change it every month anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> all right. I don't, I don't think I have any other announcements right now. I'm looking to see, trying to refresh my memory, I guess not. Let's go ahead and start our time of worship with a word of prayer. We praise your holy name, Father God, as you daily pour out your blessings upon us. Your glory is great and your love is steadfast and eternal. Father, we come into your presence and bow in awe before your majesty this and every day. We ask you, Lord, to do your will in our lives. All these things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Good morning, y'all. If you can stand as you're able to sing day by day, you'll see the lyrics here on the overhead. Day by day, day by day, oh dear Lord, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more near. Follow the more. 
follow thee more nearly day by day. Day by day by day by day by day. Amen. Please be seated. During our time of personal and congregational prayer this morning, I would ask you to continue to keep our church and the ministries of our church in your prayers. Also pray for those whose names you find on our, uh, on our weekly prayer list as well as on our continuous prayer list. I would ask you this week to add a couple of uh, prayer concerns to your list, if you will. Uh, I just, just informed this morning that Mark's cousin, Laura May, is uh, suffering with cancer and we'd ask you that you would please lift Laura May and the entire family in your prayers. Ask you to pray for Reverend Wesley Garrett. Most of you know, many of you have met Wesley. Wesley is a, not only a pastor here in the county, but he also is the coordinator for the South Richmond Baptist Center uh, over off of Hall Street. Wesley's mom passed away earlier this week. Uh, she'd been sick for quite some time, but it was still very much of a shock. So please pray for Wesley and for his family. Um, her service will be held tomorrow in Hampton. And then, of course, with the school supplies going out at the end of this week, it's, it's just going to be a very uh, tumultuous and, and bittersweet week for Wesley. So please continue to pray for him. As I've told you all, uh, Bill is home and is doing well. Uh, Pat is doing much better now that Bill is home. Uh, he continues to have in-home health care, uh, therapy, thank you, therapy, uh, two or three times a week, uh, from which he told me he is very tired, but it's a good kind of tired. He's starting to eat more, which is very important, but he, because he was not eating all that well before he got home. I think a lot of that was more uh, anxiety than anything else, but good news is he's doing much better. And we just thank God for the healing that he's already begun uh, with Bill, and we know that he will continue to do. Um, Patty arrived safely, for those of you uh, that were, were wondering. She arrived safely. Her planes were more or less on time, so that, that's a blessing in itself. So lots of folks, lots of folks that we need to be praying for this morning. And I would just ask you to not only pray for them, but pray for those people in your life, those people that you know that have special concerns or have joys to celebrate. Uh, pray for each one of them. Pray for their conditions, their situations. And always remember, please, to pray for yourselves as well. Let's go to the Lord together. Holy God of deliverance, we come before you this morning abounding in hope and humbled by your presence. How great are your mercies and how vast is your kingdom. Your love extends beyond the heavenly realm and is eternal through the ages. You alone are God. We pray that in your sovereignty you will hasten the day that all people will come to know you and that your kingdom will dwell on earth as it does in heaven. 
In your wisdom, Father, you have made us stewards of your creation. Lord, we ask you to help us to learn for ourselves and then to teach others to live in peace and harmony with you, with one another, and with this earth that you have given us. You are matchless in your giving, gracious Lord. We gratefully receive all of your blessings as you sustain us each day. Father God, we ask that you save us from greed and from the lure of the material things of this world. May we always be satisfied by the gifts you pour out on each one of us every day. And may we also be willing to share with those who are not as fortunate as we. Remind us, O oh God, that our wants are not as important as our needs. And help us to know that as long as we have your love, your mercy, and your grace, we have all that we could possibly desire. And although it can be painful, O oh God, we acknowledge our own sinfulness, and we are mindful of our need for your forgiveness. Too often we are quick to point out another's sins and refuse to see our own trespasses. Forgive us when we are quick to judge others and give to us instead each a spirit of reconciliation, especially to those who seek to cause harm to us or to others. You are our great physician and healer. So this morning we lift to you, Father, all those who are in need of physical, emotional, spiritual healing this day. Remembering especially those who are on our prayer lists and those whom we hold dear to our hearts. Only you can repair our brokenness, restore our wholeness, and set our feet back on the path of righteousness. For all those who are facing special challenges this day, Lord, we pray an extra portion of your patience, your strength, and your mercy. Reconcile us to you, Father, and to one another, so that our world can know what your peace is all about. And now as we do each week, we pray, come Holy Spirit, come and empower us to resist the evils and the temptations of this world. Perfect us in our faith and in our walk with you, so that in all that we do, you will be glorified and we will become more like Jesus each day of our lives. All these things we pray in his name as we join our voices together, praying as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If y'all can stand as you're able to sing number 456, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, both verses. Lord, linger near when 
my life is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, and thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed to each and every one of us. May you take the gifts we are about to give, multiply them, Lord, so that they can do the work that you want us to do in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be our name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, or on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. O oh, most gracious and loving Father, we come to you today knowing that you will heal all of our hurts and wants and you will grant us blessings. Be with those, Lord, who are hurting today and grant all of us the wisdom and the knowledge that you endeavor for each one of us to carry forth that we may share your word with everyone that is hurting, everyone that does not know you, Lord. And bless them. Today, Pastor Bill, as he brings us the message, open our hearts and our ears so that we will understand and take forth the charges that you have bestowed on each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Beautiful. Thank you, gentlemen. Wow. Pater Noster. Pater Noster. From the original Latin, Pater Noster translates into English as Our Father. The first two words of this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. It's interesting because it was the disciples who came to Jesus and asked him to teach them to pray as they had watched him do so many times. They had witnessed Jesus going off by himself on several occasions so that he could pray. You know, for us today, prayer is almost as natural as breathing. But for them, it was a different situation. For them, I think the reason that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray was because when he was done praying... It was almost as if he had been transformed. It was almost as if all of the troubles and, and questions that he was facing seemed to melt away, seemed to disappear. When he went up to the mountain to pray, it was a much different Jesus that came back down the mountain to be with them. And I believe that to a certain degree, selfishly, the disciples wanted that same sense of peace to be in their lives as well. For many of us, the Lord's Prayer, as we refer to it, was the first prayer that we learned. It was the first time that we learned how to pray. It was with this prayer in mind. I know for myself, we learned how to pray the Lord's Prayer, before we were able to read the words for ourselves. And that's been a long time. Those of you who receive my daily emails know that I have declared the month of August to be a month of prayer, to be a study of the topic of prayer. Today, in my message, I would like for us to delve deeper into these words that are so familiar with us, or so familiar to us. I want to take a deeper look at this prayer that has been in our hearts for so long. And it's my hope that as we study this prayer, it will reawaken in us an even more fervent desire to pray as Jesus instructed us. And Debbie, I want to thank you for your reading and for your prayers this morning. Jesus began with these words. This, then, is how you should pray. This, then, is how you should pray. Now, there have been debates among theologians and Bible scholars for generations about this particular prayer, more so about what Jesus said prior to the prayer. Some have said he taught them to pray these words. Others have said, no, no, no. He was teaching them how to pray. I go along with that second thought. But I don't want to get involved in that debate today. Because the way I read Christ's instructions are that our prayers are not about our words, but about our attitude. More importantly, I believe that they are about our relationship with God. I, along with many others, believe that every prayer, every prayer, should begin with an attitude of praise and thanksgiving for who God is and for all that he does in our lives. So if the words that you use don't line up exactly with the words of another person's prayer, it's okay. It's not what we say. It's about our relationship and our attitude with God. Jesus said in the verses leading up to today's passage, when you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles. 
because they think that their many words will be heard. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need, even before you ask him. The length of the prayer is not what matters. It's the heart of the prayer that matters most. Jesus continued, Our Father who art in heaven. This is another topic that has been debated over the centuries. Why the use of the term our Father? I believe that Jesus uses the word our to indicate to his disciples and to us the intimate nature of God with all and each of his children. Keep in mind that at the time that Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, there were so many different gods, small g, so many different gods that were worshipped. And what made Jesus God, what makes our God different from all of these others, among other things, is the fact that our God is always within our reach. Where these other gods, these small gods, as I say, were considered by the masses to be so high and so out of reach that they could not have a relationship with them. Jesus wanted his disciples and the rest of the world to know that our Father, to know that his Father is our Father, here, now, in this life, and in the life to come. And because of the importance of that relationship to Jesus, we have complete and personal access to God, just as he did. By praying Pater Noster, our Father, we are reminded that like Jesus, we too are God's children. Sadly, not all of the people in Jesus' time believe that. And even more sadly, there are many in our world today who do not believe it either. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. So what does the word hallowed mean to you? It's not a word that we use very often. It's not a word that we use every day, and that's okay. That's okay because the word hallowed is so incredibly important that we can't use it every day. Hallowed in this prayer refers to our Father's holiness, to his sovereignty, and to his righteousness, and there is none other like him. Therefore, the term hallowed should always be reserved for our Heavenly Father. Now, we are to live in an intimate relationship with him, but even in that relationship, we must always be aware of his holiness. And we must always carry a reverence for him and for his divinity. I told you several times about a young lady that I knew many years ago who began every prayer by saying, good morning, daddy, or hi, daddy, or whatever. And at first I thought that was so disrespectful until I realized it wasn't a question of respect, it was a question of intimacy. That she really, in her heart, feels that intimacy with her Heavenly Father. And it was such a blessing for her to be able to pray that way. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, have the mind of Christ in you. Christ, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. You know, at any point in his ministry, at any point in his earthly life, Jesus could have snapped his fingers and changed everything. I, I remember this from many years ago. Someone once, once said, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for us. 
Those nails couldn't hold him to the cross, neither could the rock hold him in the grave. At any point in time, God, Jesus, could snap their fingers and change everything. But that's not how our Heavenly Father works. We are God's own children, every single one of us. We are God's own children. But we are not, and we never will be, his equal. God is God alone, and he's always to be hallowed. Jesus continued with these words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let me ask you this question. What do you understand? How do you understand God's kingdom to be? How do you picture it in your mind? Yes, throughout the, throughout the Gospels, many, many times, Jesus tells the crowds, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes on and gives them an easy-to-understand description. How do you understand the kingdom of heaven? Consider this verse from Acts chapter 1. It's in verse 6. Following his resurrection, the disciples required of Jesus if he was going to restore the kingdom to, to Israel. Lord, when will you restore? Does this mean now that you've been resurrected, does this mean that the kingdom will once again be restored to Israel? They were asking if the rules and the boundaries that they knew and that they loved from when King David was in charge, when King Solomon was in charge, he was at, they were asking if, if these would come about again and they would have this, this wonderful, holy place in which to live. The problem was when Jesus was speaking of God's kingdom, He's not speaking of a physical place. He's not talking about a geographic location. But what in this prayer Jesus is telling us to do is to pray for God's reign. To pray for God's reign. To pray for a time when God will be, when God's rules will be the law of the land, not just the law of the followers. He's praying for, telling us to pray for a time when goodness will reign, when righteousness will reign, and we will not be influenced by Satan and his evil. Eventually, the Bible tells us, eventually when Jesus comes again and the new millennium begins, there will be a new geographic location to God's kingdom. It will be here on earth. But until that day, Jesus instruct us, instructs us that we are to pray that God will rule in our lives. We've, said, we've talked about this before. It starts with us. It all starts with us, individually and collectively. Pray that God will rule in your life until he comes again to rule the entire world and all that is within it. I read this quote and I, I just, I absolutely loved it. The late British evangelist, Alan Redpath, was quoted as saying, before we can pray thy kingdom come, we must be willing to pray my kingdom go. It's not about us, it's about God. Give us this day our daily bread. You notice here in the prayer, there's a change in the tone and the content of what Jesus shared with his disciples. The shift, uh, the shift changes, uh, excuse me, our focus changes to the needs and the conduct of God's children instead of, and kind of comes off the focus of God himself. We've already established who God is. And now Jesus wants us to understand our place in God's kingdom. God created each and every one of us. He created the birds, the animals, the fish, the plants. There's not a single living thing 
that was not created by and is not under the watchful eye of our loving God. Nothing that has life is beyond God's grasp. Nothing. Yes, we are God's greatest creation. But even the sparrow has a nest. But as we have witnessed, as time has passed and mankind has become more me-focused, more self-dependent and less God-dependent, we tend to think that we are in control and that God needs to be about our will. Personally, I'm glad we're not in charge. Because let's be honest about it, folks. We're real good at messing stuff up. We're just not quite as good at fixing it again. Because he is our creator, because he is our sustainer, our Heavenly Father knows every single one of your needs. Every single one of your needs is known by and is met by your Heavenly Father. He has, he does now, and he always will continue to provide for us. And we've talked before about the difference between wants and needs, haven't we? We need what? We need food, shelter, oxygen. Do we need a giant house? Do we need more food than we can possibly eat? How much oxygen can we take in? We can only take in 100%. We don't need any more. Susan and I were coming up. How many of y'all come up uh, uh, Bailey Bridge Road on your way to church? Any of y'all come up that way? Have you noticed down here by the, by the ample storage, which is right down there on Bailey Bridge, there's a sign up now in the property next to the ample storage that says, coming soon, more ample storage. They're, they're adding on to the storage uh, places that are available already. And there's more and more and more and more of those coming up. And outside of, of what used to be the little village of Midlothian, on Midlothian Turnpike, within a mile of each other, there are over 800 storage units available in two separate locations, within a mile of each other. I know, I know, I shouldn't get off on a tangent, but I'm going to, because this just drives me crazy. How much do we need? I, I understand if you're moving and, and your house hasn't been finished yet and you need to store some stuff for a little while, I understand all that. Uh, I, I understand if you're downsizing and you need to store some maybe family things that the children or the grandchildren are eventually going to... But how many storage places do we need? How much stuff is enough? We downsized when we moved back here 12 years ago. And when we moved back here 12 years ago, we had a lot of room in our house because we downsized. And now, 12 years later, oops, it all came back somehow. And believe me, I've tried to throw it away, but it just keeps coming back. I got way off, and I apologize. God will always provide whatever it is that we need. What we want is a whole other story completely. So I want you to do me a favor. This week, I want you to look in the book of Exodus. I want you to turn to the Old Testament and look in the book of Exodus. I want you to go to chapter 16, and I want you to read the first 31 verses. Exodus 16, 1 through 31, and I want you to focus on verses 20 and 21, okay? So Exodus 16, 1 through 31, and focus on 20 through 21. I think you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. 
your heavenly, your heavenly Father will supply all of your needs. He always has. And he always will. Jesus went on and said, And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I've talked about this verse before, but once again, it bears repeating. Notice in this verse, there's a, there's a give and take covenant. It is made even more clear a few verses later when Jesus says in verses 14 and 15, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If we do X, our Heavenly Father will also do X. That's a covenant. It's not just an agreement between two people. This person or this party has to do something, and in return, this party is required to do something. But then Jesus goes on and says, if you do not forgive their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Raise your hand. How many of you have ever sinned? Okay. Okay. And how many of you have ever been forgiven? Okay. All right. Do you want to be forgiven every time you make a mistake? Every time you, you sin, do you want to be forgiven? Or would you rather be punished? Should be a pretty easy question. If you want to be forgiven for every time you have sinned, you need to forgive those who have trespassed, who have sinned against you. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we need to pay special attention to this verse. Because when we ask God to forgive us, we also need to be aware of our own responsibility of forgiving others. In the Gospel according to Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to the people, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins as well. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There are, if you go on to Google or whatever search you want to use and type in the word temptation, I can't tell you how many posts there are because I can't count that high. If you want to narrow it down, go on and, and type in sermons on temptation. There are literally thousands of sermons on temptation that can be preached in our churches today. Because the Greek, part of the reason is the Greek word for temptation is also the same word for trial and for test. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray that God would not lead us into temptation, we have to put that into the proper context. James chapter 1, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, because God does not tempt his children. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted, listen now, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. In other words, temptation does not come from outside. It comes either from ourselves or from the presence of evil. However, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 does provide us with a certain assurance regarding temptation. Paul wrote, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Those things which are common to all mankind, those may have overtaken you. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, God will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 
Ever been tempted? I know one member in our congregation that is tempted every time they walk down the chocolate aisle in the, in the grocery store. I know, of, I know of at least one. Well, no way. I know of at least two. <laughs> okay? But God never allows us to be tempted beyond what we can resist. As I have shared with this other member and I share with myself on a regular basis, how best to resist that temptation? Don't walk down the aisle. Yeah, it's, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. It's common sense. And God gave each, each one of us that. Lead us not into temptation. Don't allow yourself to be led into temptation. But know that if you are, you have the power because God has given you the power and the authority to endure the temptation. Well, that's where the prayer ends, according to the writer of the Gospel of Matthew and also according to the writer of the Gospel of Luke. That's where the prayer ends. But as we have said every, more, every Sunday morning, and as more than likely you have said most of your life, if not all of your life, there's, there's more. There's more. We speak the words, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. See, we added those to the writing of the Gospels. Mankind added those later. And although they can, no one can prove where or when, it does make logical sense that at some point in time, as these translations were being uh, transcribed by different writers, by different scribes, there was at least one who believed, as I do, as I said earlier, that prayer should begin by glorifying God and they should end by glorifying God as well. More than likely, it's believed by many that the writer developed this uh, ending that we commonly use now for the Lord's Prayer based on the words of First Chronicles. I want to read this to you. It's from chapter 11 and verse 20, 29. When King David wrote these words, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in, heaven, in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as the head above all. To which each one of God's children must respond, Amen. Amen. If y'all can stand as you're able to sing when I pray, you'll see the lyrics here on the overhead.
God's holy word. This is how God speaks to you. This is how God speaks to your heart. And the way you speak to God is through your prayer. Continue to pray, my friends. Continue to pray about all things. Continue to pray to your Father in heaven. He is waiting to hear from you. He always has been. He always will be. And go out now into the world and share the love of God. Share your prayers with one another this day and forevermore. Amen.